So we talked about column layouts, row layouts, and the, the, the basic message about all of these things is, was to tell you, hey, if you lay out your data such that queries have to read less data later on, you may save a lot of work. And the, the, the reason why you can do that is not that you save computation, but you save bandwidth. You have to get the data from the storage devices, from the storage layers, uh, to your CPU. And if you lay out the data in the first place, that it fits well to what you do with later later on, you, save, you can save something. But it depends on the query. So we stopped last time by talking about these hybrid layouts, in particular PACs, PACs partition across. So that's something like that. On the high level, the idea that you uh, partition the data into horizontal partitions like that. And within a partition, you have a column layout again. You know, that's the uh, main idea of the PACs layout. And that's typically used as a compromise in practice. Doesn't mean that you necessarily take three rows. You probably want to take more. Uh, the main effect, we also talked about that, is um, the more rows you take into one of those horizontal partitions, the more scans inside a partition become like the column layout, obviously. Yeah? The, the larger the number of rows in the partition, the fewer the number of rows you take, the more it becomes like what? What, what if I partition it like that, that each partition is, con contains only one row? What would that mean? Yeah? Yeah, then it's row layout, obviously. Yeah, That's the other extreme. So you could say, depending on how you configure the packs layout, yeah, you configure it to be one extreme or mimic one extreme, the row layout, or configure it to mimic the other extreme. Let's lay a column layout, and the truth is somehow in the middle. Yeah, we looked at other examples. So basically, keep in mind, those are horizontal partitions that are then called blocks, also in the context of systems like Hadoop, Spark, and I, and all these big data platforms. Those blocks are typically way larger than the blocks we use in this lecture. So I told you, uh -huh, there's a page that's so four kilobytes, maybe it's larger, whatever, um, six, uh, eight kilobytes. And if the data belonging to the page sits on a, story, on a persistent storage medium, I call it a block. Yeah? But it's the same data. In the context of those systems, blocks are typically way larger. Yeah? It can be like 64 megabytes or something like that. But again, it's the same concept yeah? within the block. You do a column layout. Sometimes within those super blocks, or however you call them, they even do another, oops, they do another, ah, geez, iPad, one day I will learn how to use this. Um, <laughs> they partition the block inside the block again, um, but you can ignore that for the moment. For the context of this lecture, within a block, we do a column layout, and that is what um, this packs layout is about. Okay, so basically what we have here is an optimization pro uh, problem, and that's where we stopped last time. So what is the optimal layout? That depends heavily on the workload. Again, workload being the database schema, the data in that uh, database schema, and the queries you're running against that database. Yeah? A rule of thumb for you to keep in mind is basically if it's read mostly analytical, for only a few attributes being queried, you use a column store. If it's transactional, you can use a row store. However, you can have some gains for that, that are possible for the hybrid layouts. In practice, however, it's very hard to get a gain and the, the pain you have allowing for hybrid layouts, implementing lay, lay, layouts, typically doesn't pay off the effort. Yeah? So most systems go today with column layouts. Even though that's not ideal for transactional stuff, you can still do it. Um, but uh, if you make a decision like that, um, things get easier if you only have one layout. In the context of the project, you will learn in the first milestone, uh, you will see that our system mutable is configurable, where you can actually kind of declare the layout and then the system can still work with that. That's another approach that has been done by other systems as well. So you can change the layout, you can configure the layout. Yeah. Many, many things you can do here. Maybe as a warm up um, to not have you in that consumption mode, <laughs> let's do some more interaction to start with today. Um, that's a new iPod, pad, I forgot to, or oh, whatever. But I can, um, here's some free space. Cool. So assume uh, you have a, um, you're in practice, you have um, a database system, uh, queries are slow. And you, uh, you see there's one table that has a lot of attributes. Yeah, I don't know how they are. Oh, maybe it makes it a little bit smaller. Um, okay. So the table has a lot of attributes. Let's say they are named from A1 to um, A2 to 
blah, 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 to A100. Sounds silly, but it's not the most extreme thing I've seen. I've seen tables with hundreds and thousands of columns. It's completely ridiculous, obviously, because if you use NST relationship modeling well or any other modeling, you won't end up with something like that. That doesn't make sense for anything, something like that. And then assume you have many rows here. Yeah? You, um, basically, we could write down a row identifier, row one, row two, and so forth, row, what did I use here, 100, let's say it's row n. Okay, that is your relation in your database system. Unfortunately, your database system is a row store. And uh, unfortunately, you run many analytical queries against that row store. Your boss doesn't allow you to buy a new fancy column store. It's not so new anymore. But it doesn't allow you to buy a, a column store. So you have to fix the problem with the tools you have at your hands. What could you do? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Foreign key. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, that's very good. What? If you do 100 row stars, you have a column there. A 100 row stars. Okay, that's the extreme approach of what was he was suggesting. Yeah? So he was suggesting to basically split the table somehow. Yeah, I could split it anywhere here. Well, let's maybe, what is the right color here? Can I use something? Okay, so split it somewhere here and say one part of the attributes go in one relation, the other part goes in the other relation. So split, he splits the relation in two relations and still keeps a connection among rows through a foreign key relationship. In other words, he preserves the one-to-one -one map mapping yeah, in the anti-relationship uh, anti -relation um, language. What you are suggesting is to say, okay, I make a separate relation for each and every attribute I find here, and then I end up with a column store. It's the same thing, right? So why would anyone even implement a column store as a separate database engine if you could do that by, uh, this by that trick? It's an absolutely liable question, and we will look into that today, why there's still a reason to do a, a column store, why standard row stores um, cannot, uh, or typically don't, can't do the things a, a real column store can do. Huh? Okay, but that's something you could do if you, if you can't change the exchange the database system and then you somehow have a, a key concept, yeah? So somehow in each, um, can I erase this stuff somehow? No, if I write black, it's the extreme version. Farbe, black, why doesn't that work? Hmm. Eraser, ah, okay, that was too easy. Okay, so um, yeah, typically, a table has an ID, something like that, that's the key, and then you would use the same ID in all of the vertical, in all of the tables uh, you create, obviously, yeah? And along that ID, you can perform a join, and then depending on the attributes that are being asked in a specific SQL statement, you just take the, um, the, attri um, the relations that are required to answer that query. Yeah? And with that, you already lower the amount of I.O. that has to be considered by the query processor. Yeah, that's a simple trick you can play, very straightforward, and I can highly recommend trying that out as one of the first things if you have any performance problems. Okay, so with that, let's look at another topic that exists in all kinds of database systems, but is, in particular, is particularly efficient in column stores, and that is compression. And I show you here, if some, who of you uh, studies DSAI, data science, artificial intelligence? Okay, so yes, sorry, so you've seen those slides already. Huh? But uh, in the first semester, I'm uh, already showing these slides. Um, uh, so it's 10 minutes and we're, let me drink a coffee or whatever, just for, for you to <laughs> fresh up. Um, and it's, it's really important, that's why I'm showing it again. Huh? Even for you guys who have seen, who have seen it before. So, uh, we had that, when we talked about um, storage, we talked about this Hawaii example. Yeah? So there's this access time, how long does it take to, uh, for us to walk to Hawaii and back? So like the random access on a disk, where was the bandwidth? Yeah? How much data can I stream when I do a sequential read or sequential write operation? But then the question is, how can I uh, make better use of the available bandwidth? So what we will look at in the following is um, compressed to save bandwidth. So um, 
it's a bit similar to like a, a UPS truck. Assume a UPS truck and you want to deliver like uh, balloons, like for a children's birthday party, the balloons. How do you deliver the balloons? Well, well you won't blow them up first and then put them in the truck and then the truck goes somewhere. That's not very efficient, obviously. Yeah, you keep them in the little box, like hundreds of those balloons. Yeah, they remove, there's no air inside, or the air has been you know, removed. Yeah, you ship them with a the truck, and once they reach the children's um, birthday party, yeah, they have to be blown up by the parents. Yeah, that's, that's, that makes efficient use of that uh, delivery truck. And that's the same idea here. So we ship the data from the storage layer to the CPU. And while shipping, we try to compress it like crazy, such that we can exploit the bandwidth super well. That is the same idea we will be looking at in, like in the next 30 minutes or so. And do not confuse that with this one. That is the kind of compression you know that is to compress to save storage space. Yeah, I, yeah, you have a picture, and rather than, than storing the picture as a, um, one of these uncompressed formats like TGA or RAW format, you um, convert it into a compressed format like JPEG, which is lossless in that case, which eats up less storage space on your hard disk. Yeah? You save space by doing so. And that is uh, the effect on the storage layer, but we, we will be looking at the effect to save bandwidth. So um, examples of compression you know already. So uncompressed formats like um, for images, Bitmap, I'm not sure, that's very old format, TGA still exists, or RAW. Most uh, modern cam cameras, even smartphones, can um, create a RAW file that's basically the RAW me measurements as taken by the uh, image sensor versus compressed image. Run length encoding, we will look at that, PNG or JPEG. The same exists for music, of course. There is uncompressed, this WAV file. So where with a, with, with a certain uh, sample frequency, you take a measurement where, where the audio curve, uh, the analog curve currently sits, and then you could convert that into a digital value, but you don't apply any compression, whereas those formats like MP3, where you compress, again, this is, um, did I say lossless before? This is a lossy compression. Huh? So lossy means some information gets lost, like in, in JPEG, yeah? lossy compression. So you can't go back to the original value, uh, to the original uncompressed image, and the same holds for MP3. You can't fully con uh, convert, um, recover the uncompressed WAV um, wave curve here from the audio. Yeah? That's, uh, but, but the idea is that you save a lot of space, of course, and that you don't lose quality. So for MP3, when uh, people invented that, they thought about, oh, okay, how do people actually hear stuff? Uh, for instance, there were thoughts like, okay, when it's very loud and then there's a very, very subtle um, sound afterwards, they can remove the subtle sound because uh, the human ear doesn't hear it anyway. Yeah? Stuff like that. Uh, and then there were people saying, no, no, I can still hear it, and MP3 sounds, doesn't sound, I need a, <laughs> how is it called, uh, an old uh, LP. Uh, what, what, what is it? For what's in English? Uh, not, not the CD, but what came before. Vinyl, 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 yeah, vinyl, right? Yeah. And you have to have that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the context of the database, we will talk about data in the database, which is typically uncompressed, can be, doesn't have to be, versus compressed data. Yeah, so it can be in the database compressed to save storage, but also um, to help with query processing. Yeah, and we look um, at some examples uh, along. Um, certain example computations, and that looks as follows. So we will define what is the overall transfer time to send n bytes of data from storage layer X to storage layer Y without compression. That's very easy. We had that before. So basically, we take the number of bytes n and divide those bytes by the bandwidth, BW being the bandwidth. Um, X and Y are the storage layers. And that gives me the transfer time. So as an example, if you have a um, transfer time of 10 gigabytes per second, and you have um, uh, 1,000 gigabytes, yeah, you divide 1,000 by 10, and you get 100 seconds. Yeah? 10 gigabytes per second for 1,000 gigabytes, you need 100 seconds, obviously. Fragen? Any questions? 
No? Okay, so it's a very easy um, computation. And in the following, I will assume that reading from a storage layer or writing to a storage layer is not the bottleneck. So I'm really concentrating here on the transfer in between storage layers. That's the only thing I'm looking at. And then you can do a, a simple, the same calculation uh, for the time with compression. So how would you transfer compressed data? Well, you first have to compress the n bytes. The data you want to send are the n bytes. And then you receive n c bytes, yeah? So I don't specify whether n c is smaller than n or bigger than n. Hope, let's hope it's smaller than n. Obviously, otherwise your compression algorithm increases the file size. That may happen. And particularly if you try to compress something that's already compressed. Uh, if you apply, for instance, the same uh, compression algorithm multiple times, you will see that the file will get bigger and bigger. So let's hope that n c is bigger. And then we can compute the transfer time. That's what we uh, computed on the previous slide. And um, finally, add the time to decompress. Yeah? So the input here is a compressed stream, so the NC bytes, and that will uh, recover the N bytes we compressed originally. Uh, again, here are the uh, labels I used. And then, of course, there's a sweet spot. Yeah? So you com you're compressing data to save bandwidth, and that only makes sense if this time we computed here is strictly smaller than the time to transfer the uncompressed data. Yeah? So we want to be faster than what we did before. However, that depends on many, many factors. So one, uh, one is the data compression ratio. Yeah? So by which factor can you compress, uh, can you squeeze uh, the, the inflated balloons to become such a only a piece of rubber which can be transferred very easily? Yeah, and that may depend on what you want to um, transfer. The runtime of the compression algorithm. Yeah? How long does it take? Some algorithms take more, others take, uh, uh, take longer, uh, others ta uh, take a shorter time to compress, and the same for decompression. Yeah? And of course, to make matters more complex, many algorithms have a different time for keep compression versus decompression. Yeah? You can also factor that in. Yeah, so that gives us the overall calculation, and let's look at uh, some examples. So assume the transfer time for one terabyte. Uh, as before, again, the same, um, so before the 1,000 gigabytes is one terabyte, of course. So, uh, the bandwidth is the same as before. And then we did this calculation already without compression, right? So that's what we uh, talked about, 100 seconds. And now let's look at uh, different variants of uh, how to use compression. And the first example is with an expensive compression algorithm. So let's assume that the time to decompress n bytes is five gigabytes per second. And the compression ratio is a factor of five. Yeah? So we have only one fifth of the original input data size. And then you can do the mass. So the time to compress um, 1,000 gigabytes yeah, is this one. Uh, that, I should just show the decompression. Yeah? The compress is one gigabytes per second, so that's already a thousand seconds just to compress one terabyte of data. Yeah? That's this one, one thousand seconds. Then the transfer time, because we're down by a factor of five, is we only have to transfer 200 gigabytes rather than one terabyte. So it's 20 seconds rather than 100 seconds as before. So here we save 80 seconds. Then we decompress, that's a bit faster. We know decompression is five gigabytes per second and it's measured in the input size. Yeah? So five times, um, what is the input size? It's uh, um, 40 seconds, why do I get, so it's five gigabytes per second. Um, yeah, 40 times five is 200, so 200 gigabytes. That's basically the size of the um, compressed stream. And that's 1,060 seconds, which is way bigger than the 100 second seconds we, we used before. So that's a bad decision. Yeah? So the compression algorithm doesn't really work well in this context. So that's where uh, things go wrong. So you, you made things worse. However, that's the second example. Assume you have an inexpensive compression algorithm, algorithm, something like that, that can compress very fast, 50 gigabytes compression, 100 gigabytes decompression, compression ratio. That's uh, typically where you pay a price. Yeah, so the compression is not that good. Yeah, it's only a factor three, yeah, but the, the computation times for compressing and decompressing are much better. Then you get a calculation like that. That's 56.6 .6 seconds, and that's better than that one. 
Yeah, so by compressing, you transfer, you have a better transfer time, interestingly. Yeah? And that's the effect we're aiming at. So when using compression, we all, always want to make sure, of course, yeah, that we're better than this guy. Whatever we do, we want to be smaller than that guy, otherwise compression doesn't pay off in a particular scenario. Yeah, so let's look at this survey. So four possible answers. Which one is right? Which one is wrong? So how can we improve this transfer time for the compressed data further, even for a subset of the non-beneficial scenarios where the transfer time as computed before on the compressed data is bigger, bigger than the uncompressed time? So what I'm saying is, doing this calculation here, yeah, you get a clear answer. Doesn't work. Yeah, don't do it. That's a bad idea. Now my question is, even if your calculation shows up like that, may there be situations where you still could do something? And what would that be? Yeah? So that is the question. And let's look at, let's look at A. Maybe let's do a vote before looking at individual answers. So compress the data to be transferred before the request to transfer that data is received. Who believes that that is a good idea? Yeah. Who believes that that is a bad idea? Who thinks, uh, I'm not so sure what the professor is talking about. <laughs> yeah, is the general trade-off clear? Yeah. Again, if you look at the um, air balloons um, analogy, the question is, yeah, how many, um, how many um, air balloons can you squeeze in this box? Yeah, because the, the, the number of boxes you can uh, squeeze in a whatever GPS, UPS, whatever, German po post, DP, uh, German post, what? DHL uh, uh, truck um, is limited. It's a, it's, a, it's a number. Let's say it's 45,000 of those boxes. Yeah? So the question, the only question we can um, now, uh, think about this, how many air balloons do I squeeze in here? And how much effort? Yeah, is it like, it's really like, <coughs> yeah, is it doing something like that? It's a lot of effort. Maybe I spend like half an hour pressing the air balloons into this box and the box will be ruined anyway and whatever. Yeah? But that's basically the trade-off if you make. Or you just do it like, next box, next box, yeah, with little effort. That's a, the kind of things we're talking about. So A, maybe some individual answers, some raised, yeah? So it depends on uh, the scenario. If we only spend the data after creating it to another surface, then maybe it's a good idea to compress it. Mm -hmm. so okay. If it's got some, some random request, then uh, it doesn't make sense. And uh, of course, it makes sense uh, to do some statistics that we can find it out. Okay, mm, yeah. Fair, other? So that, for example, the compression algorithm takes way more time. Yeah. You just do it once and save the, the results in the database instead of recomputing it every time. You feel the leaves are very fast. Amortization. You do that once. You store the saved stuff on the server and then you stream it to the requests. YouTube is exactly the same thing, Netflix as well. It's not that you request a movie by Netflix and then, oh yeah, uh, Peter Müller wants to see the movie. Oh, it's really difficult. Oh, that's a lot of data. We, we, we compress it <laughs> for that guy, right? No. You do it before, store the saved stream, and then you send it. Yeah. Request it? Yes, very good. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you do? You cannot compress like every, let's combinatorial approach like we do. Maybe. Yeah, okay. Let's, okay. Okay, so he thinks, okay, very fair argument. So I made a hidden assumption here. I said, okay, uh, or he did it as well, saying, okay, I, I only do that once because I expect, my assumption, is that multiple people will be interested in the same da data and therefore it will pay off. That is what amortization is about. It's not only one guy requesting it, it's multiple guys, and therefore the stuff pays off because I only do it once and then stream it. Now he comes in and says, 
but I can't know what people are requesting, which is absolutely right. Okay, any comments on that? Well, how could you fix that? In the context of, let's, let's go back to databases, huh? not so much movies, but movies, it's too clear. Is there someone else? Or you with the green pullover? Yeah. Just optimization on specific context. Maybe not compressed everything, but just. Yeah, yeah. Okay, other ideas? Maybe, yes. no, no, maybe you? Uh, you should either have more data than, uh, more data than you actually need, and then you without a graph, you look at it automatically, or you decompress exactly the data that you want, and then just like that. Yeah, that, that's all fair. Yeah, so, so bottom line for databases is, we will talk about that later, what is the granule of compression? Yeah, in your scenario, you're absolutely right. The combinatorial explosion is, won't happen, doesn't make sense, but you could do it page-wise. Again, take like every K rows, compress them, yeah, and if those rows uh, contain a hit, you ship the entire page, have some overhead, yeah, and uh, decompress it on the receiving side. Yeah, then depends again on, okay, how many hits are in all of these calculations. Yeah? So I'm just saying there are solutions for that. Uh, they, they, they may be complex, but you can still do that. Yeah? And um, anyway, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, what, what the query processor does, um, I mean, it depends on where you send. If you send the query result, you can compress it anyway when shipping it to the client. That's, I mean, that's what you want to send anyway. Uh, what we are, will be looking at is between storage and the query processor. How can you make use of that? Yeah? We will look at different examples that um, address those questions. Okay, so if you go back to that one, compressor data to be transferred before the request to transfer, um, the request to transfer that data is received. That is in, not in all. So that, that's another thing I have to explain for this lecture. You will uh, hear that very often um, the right way of answering a question in this lecture, other lectures as well, starts with two words. It depends. It depends, comma, blah, blah, blah. So it depends on, well, are you in a scenario where it's more like this and that? Or is your curious more like that and this? Or is it more like that you, yeah? If it's like that, then that's a solution, yeah? If, uh, if an answer is like, I, 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 I um, um, ask you something and you answer, it's like this and that, it's this 95% likelihood wrong because you didn't state your assumptions. Yeah? Um, isn't there uh, the possibility to have like uh, compression algorithms in the hardware so that yeah. every time you put something yeah. in the hardware you just yeah. compress it down? Yeah, that's true. You can have compression in the hardware. Um, where do I start? Um, yeah, let's make the footnote. Okay, whatever. <laughs> you can do anything in hardware. If you go back to what we talked about hard disks, for instance. Yeah, last time hard disks, long story. Um, if you, if you, if you want to have, if you have a relation with many tables, what do you do? You read the table into your CPU, filter the qualifying tuples, and there you go. Other approach is to push down the filter operation into the hardware. You tell the hardware, hey, disk, only give me tuples qualifying that. That's called a smart disk that works for SSDs and also for good old hard disks. Yeah? Like that, you can put um, intelligence into the hardware. And the same holds for compression. Uh, you could compress the data on the fly in the hard disk with a lightweight algorithm, depending on how much computing, uh, computation power you have. Yeah? Send the compressed stream up, decompress it, do the computation. That's possible. Yeah? It's, it's not the standard case for hardware that would be called, I mean, <sighs> This is for high-end databases, and, and the market for that is not so big. That's the reason why typically the standard hardware doesn't do this stuff. Yeah? But there exists hardware that can do that. Yeah. Okay, so A is true. It depends. Yeah, it depends if it's a scenario where things are requested very often. You should compress it ahead. It doesn't have to be one compressed stream. It can be many chunks, like horizontal partitions, whatever, but it works. That's true. What about B? So who believes that B is correct? When receiving the compressed data, do not decompress it, then do whatever you want to do with the data on the compressed data. So that is basically killing 
this part of the equation, it's saying, okay, I written here this one, saying, I don't care, I, I get the receive, I get the compressed stream, and I will work with the compressed stream. I won't bother to decompress it. I work directly with the compressed data. So you kill that from the equation. So who believes that this is a good idea? Raise your hand. Okay, who believes that there's not a good idea? Okay, very good, that's like 50-50. Um, yeah, so fight for your conviction. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Right, yeah, okay, that, that, that's fair. I just want to send it around, you save the compressed data. I mean, it could be, uh, an example is um, a caching network for a video streaming platform. Yeah, you distribute the um, um, compressed video files over the planet somehow, stored in different data centers, no need to do any computation, you just store the stuff. Yeah? But let's go back in the context of a database system. Let's assume we send around relations in compressed format, whatever that compressed format looks like. So how would I do a query on the compressed data? So who said it doesn't make sense? Or, well, do you want to say something? I, I said it makes sense if the, well, it depends if the... Yeah, good. But it's even better if you say it at the beginning of the sentence, yeah. okay? <laughs> Yeah, homomorphic encryption. Yeah, that, that's a, a, another extreme. You can encrypt data and still do computation on it. It's called homomorphic encryption. Encryption is, in a way, you could call it compression if you want it. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's an argument in favor. Huh? Uh, another option could be that you don't need to decompress data directly, so you can decompress it from your yeah, so you mean you first store it when receiving, and only when you have time, like in the background, a background thread. Yeah, that's a f very good idea. You could do that. Other ideas? Yeah? It depends. Uh, yes, it depends, <laughs> comma. Yeah? It is, it is, the comma is hard to pronounce, but you make a little break, and then it's, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's all right. And, yeah. uh, sometimes the data is, uh, you can lose data when you are compressing. And when you decompress, it doesn't come with original form. So it could be a okay. thing. It's all fair with the knowledge that you have. Yeah, but by the end of the lecture, you may want to revise that, okay? <laughs> 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 so, which makes it clear that this works, of course. Huh? <laughs> I will show you how later on. <clears throat> Not always, but sometimes. So, what about C? that compression and transfer overlap. So who believes that this is true and can help? Who believes that this is wrong? Who is wondering, it looks like that the answer to all of these questions is yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, you can overlap it, of course. Why not? I mean, it's all about streaming data, right? If you um, start compre compressing stuff, yeah, this, this looks like a function. Let me go back to this one. This looks like a function call. It's a typical error we do in thinking. Okay, we first call it with the n bytes, and we wait for the function to complete. Yeah, then the entire compressed stream is materialized, and then we pass it to the transfer algorithm, transferring it, collecting it. Once the data is collected, we pass it to decompression. Now, there's something like streaming. In Unix, there's this pipe symbol, for instance. But in database systems, you also use streaming. That can overlap. Yeah, and then the highest of those times will dominate everything. Yeah, so you can still find situations that still make sense. <clears throat> yeah, what about four? I just said let decompression and transfer overlap. Of course, same thing. Yeah, if you can overlap compression with transfer, you can overlap decompression with transfer. 
So there are many more scenarios uh, where um, one can identify. Okay, <clears throat> and that's basically what you alluded to here. <clears throat> so the question is, what do we, how do we compress data in a database? And that, that, that's a trade-off, a decision you have to make. So let's start here. You could say, okay, I have my database with a zillion relations. I compress everything, yeah? And whenever I want to access anything, be it a relation, be it a tuple, I have to decompress like the entire database. That's the um, compression granularity, and that has a low accessibility. <clears throat> the compression ratio, however, will be super high. It will be, will be good, green, good, red, bad. And then you can go down to the other extreme, like you could take an individual attribute value, say attribute value an integer 42. Yeah, and each and every integer you find in your database, you pass to the compression algorithm individually. Yeah, it's completely, doesn't make sense idea. Yeah, but you could do that. So you have the maximum accessibility, like in the uncompressed database. However, the compression ratio will be close to zero. Yeah, it will actually create more overhead than um, benefit. Yeah? So in between are different granules. So we could compress a tuple, a page, any horizontal partition of a table, entire tables, and so forth. Yeah? And that's sometimes a difficult decision, which again depends on your schema, your data, your queries, in other words, the workload. Yeah? Okay, <clears throat> so let's look at some algorithms that are useful in database systems. Uh, and one is called dictionary compression. So what is dictionary compression? Assume uh, this relation, three relations, uh, not three relations, uh, one relation with uh, three attributes, and the key here is a name. Don't do that um, in real life. You, you would use an ID, of course, but for simplicity, I'm using the name as a key here. Let's hope there isn't any duplicate in the example. I don't think there is. Cool. So, and you see they live in uh, certain streets and they live in certain cities. So what does dictionary compression do? It basically removes the values from one uh, of the attributes and puts them into a separate dictionary, like an English-German dictionary. It's the same idea, a dictionary. Yeah? This is, uh, so it translates from database lingo to whatever your language is. That's the translation process you're doing. So basically saying, if you come with a city ID, one, it gives you the string Copertino. And if you have a dictionary like that for each and every distinct value occurring in the original column, you can basically replace all of the original entries here, the strings with the city, with their corresponding IDs in the dictionary. Okay, that's called dictionary compression. And yeah, why would that make any sense? I think you should do the lecture and I just asked stupid questions. And it's way more fun for me as well. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, if you heard about database normalization, I don't do it in my undergrad lecture anymore because I think it's boring. First reason and the second is we don't really need that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, 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 the academic argument, of course, you have to justify that. Uh, also, we have, the, we have these discussions among database professors as a Slack group for Germany. Hey, do you do normalization? And we did that question recently, and like half of it was saying, of course, we have to do it. And the other half was saying, no, no way, <laughs> for what? Yeah? And I was in the letter, of course. And then the reason is, if you do entity relationship modeling well, you don't need normalization. If you work with a shitty legacy database, oh boy, you will need <laughs> normalization. Yeah, but if you start from scratch and do the ER, no need. Yeah? So that's basically what you know about. Okay, that's true, it's kind of a normalization process, but um, yeah, it looks similar, but actually you're not, you, you, yeah, okay, you're removing redundancy, not in the sense of those norm, no, normal forms, yeah? maybe no first, second normal form, not quite. Yeah? Yeah, but of course you remove redundancy in that sense that certain strings are represented multiple times. Yeah? There you're absolutely right. Yeah? Okay, but what other effects does something like that have? Yeah. We need to store the dictionary with data and if we have like different values, the dictionary will like only give our heads. 
ah, okay, I think what you mean, let me rephrase that. You, you say that if the original values here are pairwise distinct, then you shoot yourself in the foot because the only thing you uh, create here is overhead yeah, by adding those extra IDs. And then basically you will have a vertical partition containing the original data. So, aha, there's a hidden assumption. I'm making a hidden assumption. There are duplicates. Therefore, this will pay off eventually. Right, very good. That's one effect. Another effect. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's very storage efficient. Absolutely. We save storage space. That's correct. You want to say something? It's okay. Okay. Same thing. Now your query. Yeah. Previously, let's assume you have a query that uh, selects all the cities, uh, uh, each row. I want to have all the rows where city equals Saarbrücken. Yeah, you go through the data, yeah, you do these string comparisons in this uh, version. What do you do in this? You look up first the dictionary, okay, Saarbrücken, is with, which city ID is that? Okay, that's city ID two. And then you do the query on the original table and filter for two only. If this is a column, hui, that is fast, right? Depends on how the column is represented. Yeah, this is only, in this example, we have only two different values, so in theory, you could uh, um, consider a column representation where each value only contains two, uh, two bits. Two bits are enough to represent uh, four different values. We only have three, so the, everything is fine. Yeah, so four bits, uh, sorry, two bits per column, two bits times the number of columns. That will be the size of the entire column. Way faster than scanning through tons of strings. Yeah, that is why column representation may make a lot of sense. Yeah? Um, when you, you have the skeptic. This is really, I really like that. <laughs> so, yeah, give, give it to me, yeah. <laughs> so when you did other types of queries, then you need to join on the... Um, uh, Foreign key relationship? Yes. If you project the city out, what would you do? How would you, let's assume select star, uh, no, select city from colleagues. Is that what you mean? No. Um, let's say we select each international people named C and. Okay. All attributes are selected. Give me a sec, because I don't know whether that makes sense. Another hint. Yeah, if you feel like something make, um, doesn't make sense, typically you can find a situation, it's a question of what you say after the it depends. Yeah, so if you ever say it doesn't make sense, uh, they can you, then you can add, oh yeah, but it depends on if I'm in this crazy, super fancy, doesn't ever uh, occur situation, it still would make sense. Yeah, 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 doesn't, sounds better than saying it doesn't make sense. Yeah? Because you found a weird situ situation where it makes sense. Uh, okay, let me, let me explain the query first, and then we have an idea, and uh, can, uh, we can add to your query. Yeah? So let's first continue doing that. So I do that for other columns as well, because I know there are many repetitions. The street is rep uh, repeated. The people, uh, the colleagues live in the same street, in the same city. I get another dictionary for, just for the streets. And basically, what I need to do for something like that is a query rewrite. So I can't use the original query like this. Now, that is what we... I had before asking for Unistreet, but I do it here with a subquery saying, okay, there's a nested SQL statement, a subquery, and, um, and what it does is from the dictionary for streets, it selects um, the street that's called Unistreet, that's this condition here, yeah, gives me the street ID, this one, and now let's wait for the red stuff to disappear, yeah, so basically this is reduced to the corresponding street ID of Uni Street. And Uni Street is, where are my streets? Uh, what, three, yeah? So basically this goes away, will, will be removed, um, um, removed um, replaced by three, and then this is a query being run against Colix three. Yeah, way more efficient. Yeah? And it's not a, re it's kind of a join, but um, in reality, I mean, it's just one lookup in this dictionary. So typically you have, um, 
appropriate data structures, we call them indexes, we will get to that later on, that allow you to efficiently look up for each street, which is the street ID, and vice versa, for which street ID, what is the, the string, the street, in that scenario. Yeah? 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 Yeah. So it depends. <laughs> I, I always want to do some t-shirt with that. Yeah, but yeah um, so when, when do you believe dictionary compression makes sense? When doesn't it make sense? Yeah, someone else? Well, then you again? As soon as we get what? Overhead. Overhead, yeah, yeah. The question is when do we get overhead, yeah? And she's alluding to, okay, there may be situations where dictionary compression doesn't really help, yeah? So typically if the data values are relatively short, numbers, yeah, or if there are many different values, not so good. Yeah, so in those examples, I have a lot of duplicates. You see that in the number of rows in the dictionary, three versus whatever that number of rows is. Yeah, but it can be this, it can have the same length in dictionary. Again, that's what we said before. Yeah, if if they are all pairwise different, uh, the strings here, it doesn't really pay off. Yeah, so it really depends on the distribution of values. So basically, you can do a simple statistical analysis here. Databases can do that. Yeah, they compute how many distinct values do I have. Then you can do a, a computation. Um, an estimator that gives you a value, okay, probably if I do dictionary compression, compression I save like 30%. Or it can tell you, no, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah? So it depends a lot on the data available, available in those tables. So for strings, it, it may, it's typically a good decision. It doesn't have to be, but uh, can be. Okay, so that's a query write. And yeah, if you uh, talk about dictionary compression, we should also talk about domain encoding. So if you define a relation in a database system, uh, we only make a five minute break today because, uh, okay, let's uh, do another two minutes and we do a five minute break. Um, if you define um, a domain, uh, what is a domain? That's a type of a column in a relation. Yeah? You say create table, then you have, have the attribute name, column, and the, um, and the domain, the type of that column. You can make a decision. You can say, okay, I use a varchar, I use an in64. Depends on the uh, database system you're using underneath. Yeah? So already in the database, when you define such a column, you can always make a decision to define, uh, to use a type that's as narrow as possible. Because if it's very narrow, it means you don't waste so much space. Yeah, this is a good example. So if you used an int uh, with, I don't know, an int 64 or something like that in this situation, for this kind of data, well, that's kind of a bad idea because, again, it's two bits. It would be enough here yeah, if your database system offers that bit type somehow. Depends, again, on the product. Yeah? So whenever you, um, you define a schema, it's... Uh, it makes sense to think about, do I really need such, such big types? I mean, if you have few tuples in your, ad, um, in, in your tables, it won't make a big difference. But if tables get longer and longer, many more tuples, then it may eventually make a difference. And then it's a, a relatively it's low-hanging fruit to think about, okay, what would be an appropriate type? And then you could, for instance, analyze the data that you have. Yeah, what is the biggest type? What do I have to represent? Blah, 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 blah. And then change the type accordingly. Yeah? Um, yeah, and versus dictionary compression is, uh, is something um, that uh, I have so many things I could tell you uh, before the break. Okay, let's do the five minute break and I think about what I tell you and what not afterwards, okay? <laughs> you also see it in programming languages, of course, you could do an enum type. Yeah, if you define an enum, so the list of possible values that a type may have, you could define an enum containing three values like New York, Cupertino, and Saarbrücken. 
Yeah? You give that type a name, that's your city enum, and then basically you assign that type to that column. So this column will be of type of that enum. That would implicitly do the same thing. Uh, create a dictionary of the possible values, internally just use an ID to the dictionary. Um, yeah. So there are many levels, so many ways how you could do that. But then, of course, you always would have to, whenever the, someone adds a city that's not part of your enum type, then you would have to extend the enum type. So it's not so flexible. No? Typically, um, you want to have the system to work still if uh, other data is being inserted. Okay, so... Here's again a summary uh, of advantages and disadvantages. So we basically convert strings to numeric data. Single row access is still possible. Additional compression methods may be applied. We will get to that. And it can be exploited for query processing, as I showed you. Uh, so once you did the lookup in the dictionary and you know what the ID is you're looking for, you can work on the compressed stream. The compressed stream being the integers, yeah, the foreign keys referring the entries in the entries in the dictionary. Savings again depend on duplicates, um, the number of duplicates in those entries and uh, extra joins to the to the dictionary may happen. Huh? So there's no free lunch. So let's look at another encoding method that's not so common because it complicates query processing. We will only do that briefly, um, more like for completeness. So that was our dictionary compression example. And now what we could do is we uh, forget the dictionaries for a moment and sort the data on street ID. Yeah? That's the only difference you're seeing here. So now you have all the zeros and all the ones, one, two, threes, four, five, uh, in the sorted sequence. And now what you could do is um, basically logically what that means is this block of zeros spans like three rows here the one, three rows, one row, and so forth, and so forth. And that can be represented by, um, I know, first things first. So first, we also do the same thing uh, with the second column. So within, if you go back, you see it here. For instance, within this group of rows having a street ID of one, that's this one, um, I sort on city ID. Yeah? You see here, this is not sorted yet. That's what I'm doing now. I sort on the second attribute. So I first sort on street ID. And then for all rows having the same street ID value, I sort on the second criteria, criterion, and that's city ID. That's called a lexicographical sort order. You sort along multiple attributes. If the first attribute is already different, we don't have to look at the other ones. But if the first is the same, yeah, then you have to look at the second, if that's the same at the third, if it exists, and so forth. That's called lexicographical sorting. Yeah, and then basically you end up with a relation like this one. Yeah, this is very interesting here. You have all three. These three rows have both three and two for those attribute values. And now you can do something that's called run length encoding. The idea is you represent multiple attribute values by a single entry. And the entry looks as follows. It is an XY pair where, uh, which is read as the value X, the value X appears Y times. So this is saying the value zero appears three times, value one, three times, and so forth, and so forth. Yeah. This, of course, only makes sense if you sorted the data, sorted the data in the first place. Yeah, so if you go back, yeah, so the zero appears three times. Three rows have the zero. So that's why I can replace it by uh, zero, three. Yeah? The one, three times, one, three. The two, ones, two, one, three, three, four, one, five, one. Okay, that's the run length encoded version of that column. And um, yeah, you could do the same with the other column, of course. But of course, in the lexicographical uh, order, you already see that um, here the compression effects are not that beneficial anymore because uh, the numbers, I mean, you, you can't reorder the entries, obviously, because then you would lose the connection to the remainder of the table. So you could do something like that. It would look as follows. So this is beneficial for data with many repetitions. 
in particular in image processing, you can see that if you have image representations, whether you have a lot of zeros and a lot of ones, that's relatively straightforward. Okay, if I have 5,000 zeros, rather than representing them individually, I just write 0, 5,000. Can be exploited for query processing. However, it's makes it awkward. Yeah? So you might need to sort the data first. That is maybe expensive. Again, savings depend on the number of du adjacent duplicates. There's no single row access anymore. Now you see it here. Now the correspondence of which entry belongs to which other, you can compute that, of course. Yeah? It's not rocket science, but makes things more complex, more error prone, all these things. So this is typically not used in database systems. Um, but if you have data that looks like that, it can be beneficial. Okay, let's look at a method that's, um, that's more useful and more often used in the context of databases. <clears throat> so what do we do here? Let's assume that is a relation you're looking at and now you're wondering, how could I impress the sum ID column? So who would use dictionary compression? It depends, so you could use dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have to do research on a second show for this lecture. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, what, what would be the, the, the features helping me to decide whether dictionary compression is a good idea or not? Yeah. Um, you can look for yeah. Oh yeah, right. There's one, three, four, five, right? Ah, that's also a duplicate, that's true. And uh, now we can calculate how much data our storage space mm -hmm. is in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And uh, also for queries, if you still have the query optimization mm -hmm. in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Could make sense. That's what he's saying. I have to do the math first. So he's saying it depends on the math. It depends on the cost estimate. I can't make a decision without doing a back on the envelope calculation. Very good. Other ideas? If you see something like that in the schema, and this is some ID, so it's probably not the key of that relation because it has duplicates, obviously. Can't be the key. Yeah? I would have underlined it anyway. And anyway, you look in the schema definition, you would say primary key equals true or something like that. This is not the primary key, but it is an ID. So if something has an ID in the name, it typically means it's a foreign key to something. Yeah, so these are IDs linking to some other relation yeah, where the sum ID, maybe that's the sum relation, and it has an ID, and that's why it's called sum ID. Yeah? And here, of course, Entries are distinct, but you will find those entries there. Yeah? Standard database relational modeling. So if you see this, is there uh, anything else that, um, yeah? yeah? If it's just a foreign key, nobody cares about it except for the key that you match. So you can basically just give every um, row a new key. That yes, you exactly. Yeah? So these keys in foreign key relationships shouldn't have a semantic. And if you gave them a semantic in your application, you did something very, very wrong. Yeah, if there's a query in your application selecting, oh, give me um, for my relation all the rows that have a sum ID of 42. No, you don't do that. Yeah, these keys don't carry any semantic, semantics. Yeah, so what he's saying is, okay, I have these screwed up keys, why don't I renumber that with a dense um, numbering? Yeah? So now I have to be careful. Uh, so this could be zero, this could be one, this could be two, and this is also two, right? Uh, three, where was the other duplicate? Four, five, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so from zero to nine, yeah, and of course I better renumber the sum uh, relation accordingly, yeah, but then you replaced it with smaller IDs. Okay, that's the best thing you could do and uh, yeah, with the tools available in the database system. 
Okay, <clears throat> so you go to your boss, you ask him, hey, um, you could do that, that's, that's a smart thing to do. Uh, uh, dear boss, am I allowed to do that? And he says, no, you're not allowed to do that, we can't do that, that's a business case, uh, blah, 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 whatever. You're not allowed to do that. Still, you wanna fix that. Now what? So the scenarios really, there are many of those ideas and they have varying lengths. And the question, what can you do? And there's one technique I want to show you. Um, yeah, that's basically what you just said. You reassign those. Hey, it wouldn't have been necessary to write those things. Um, anyway. <laughs> so that's called 7-bit encoding. And the idea is, from the standard 8 bits, you have in a byte. You now say, the first bit is a signal bit. And the remaining 7 bits are the load of that byte. If that bit here is set, this um, means there's another byte following. Here this bit is zero, which means all the information is available in those seven bits. Now, those seven bits represent this binary number and that happens to be 87 in decimal, okay? So if, if the number is up to um, two to the power of seven bits, 128, you can represent it here. If it's bigger, you not have to add another byte. Yeah, so you do it here, you say, okay, now the signal bit is one, saying, oh, there's another byte coming up. You better, better also consider that. Then you say zero, saying, no, there's no other byte coming up. It's, it's just those two bytes. And the load is those seven bits concatenated with those seven bits. That is this binary number, and that's this one. Okay, that's called seven-bit encoding. It's used in, in, in some of the places. You sometimes see it in the wild. And of course, you can add as many bytes as you wish. Eventually, you, the last byte, okay, has to set the bit to zero. Yeah? Otherwise, it will never stop or you create an error. Yeah? But that's basically the encoding. So that's a very neat and very simple idea if you think about it, but very useful if you have numbers of varying lengths that, where you can't do anything about it. We're not allowed to renumber them in the database, okay? Seven-bit encoding. Here's another example with three bytes and so forth and so forth. Okay, advantages are, um, that's beneficial for data of varying lengths. Um, beneficial if the symbol distribution is unknown. So if there might be, might be the case if there are other symbols coming up, uh, other integers coming up, we don't know how long they are. It can be exploited for query processing. Still, it's um, not easy, but you can do it. Disadvantage is variable with code, sometimes awkward to handle, in particular in the storage hierarchy, alignment may break, and one eighth of the space is wasted for signal bits, yeah? so you're losing something. So again, there's always a price. So in summary, data layouts here for you to read it back home, but maybe go through it again. So they may have a huge impact for smaller databases, probably not, not so much. But if it goes in the direction of many, many tuples, analytical query processing on large data sets, then this is something you really should uh, think about. The general rule is you try to reduce the amount of data moved around in the storage hierarchy. Column layout is a good idea for many, many scenarios, in particular if it's analytical, also for transactional it's being used. However, for transactional the row layout is somewhat better. Text is a compromise in practice. You will find it under different names, one being arrow, the other being parquet, and there are five other names for it, but it's always the same idea. These other approaches, column grouping and vertical partitioning, you will still find advocates of those approaches, but they're rarely useful in practice, so stay away from that. Domain encoding is a very easy, very cheap method, so think about your types. You know, what are your domains? That may make a huge difference in large tables. More heavyweight compression, well, usefulness depends, really. You do the mass, what does my algorithm, how much time does it need? Recall the survey we did. Yeah? You can overlap certain things, you can compress it once, ship it multiple times, all of these things have to be considered when making a decision for a heavyweight compression algorithm. Yeah, that's it for data layouts. With that, we move to the next topic, and that is indexing.